Welcome to the ninth part of our Strong Tower series. I'm especially excited for today's because it is Passover. And we're looking, of course, as you know, at the different attributes of the Lord. Today's is that He is Redeemer. Now this plays right in to the truths that we learn through Passover. So you can see we're coming up the stairs here to the upper room of the church building. And this is because... On Jesus' last Passover, the one right before his crucifixion, he was in an upper room with his disciples. So come on up and join me here in our upper room. Now, of course, as you come in, your first thought is, what is wrong with those tables? They're all the way down at the floor, and this is the way it would have originally been because they would recline for this meal. And there is the uh, horseshoe-shaped tables that we have going on here. This is the way that they would have been laying all the way around, or reclining as it were. So we're going to take a little tour through the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, because that is where the details are found for Jesus' final Passover, again, right before the cross. And so I want to begin by reading verses 6, actually we'll we'll start at verse 7, we'll go verses 7 through 8. It says this, Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus said uh, to Peter and John, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Now when Jesus tells Peter and John to go and prepare, This was not a a small deal. There was a lot involved in preparing for a Passover meal. They would begin, of course, by locating the upper room where they met that particular Passover. And first thing, once they're inside that upper room, they would have gone through a a special ceremony called Bedeket Chametz, which is a cleaning of any leaven in the room. That's yeast because it symbolized sin. So after doing basically a really intense spring cleaning, then they would begin to prepare what we have right here, the Seder plate. And in Hebrew, this word Seder, it means order. And so there's a particular order in remembering God's great deliverance of his people from Egypt. They were slaves there and God was leading them out. He was saving them. He was redeeming them. And so here with the Seder plate, uh, Peter and John would have spent time putting this together. We have more elements on this Seder plate nowadays than what they would have originally had. But I'm going to take time to just quickly go through and, and speak about each element. And, and the first thing that we see right here is this is the carpus. It's a parsley. And it is significant because it symbolizes life. There's this fresh greenery that symbolizes life. And we also have a bowl with some water, and there is salt already in there. I'm going to use some kosher salt. And just so you can see, I'm going to pour in uh, just a little bit of salt. Okay, that's probably enough, right? The reason I went overboard with the salt is because that is symbolic of tears. And the people were in in slavery for so many years. There would have been many tears spilled. And so during the Seder, uh, one would place this carpus, this uh, symbol of life, into the tears. Because, truth be told, with life comes tears. Not only when we're in bondage uh, there in Egypt, God's Jewish people, but even today... Tears are a part of a part of our life. Another really important element is this. It's bread, and it, it's flat like a cracker because it has no yeast. It has no leaven in it. So uh, again, very significant to the fact that there is no sin involved with this Passover Seder, uh, and and that's going to become even more pronounced the further in to the Seder that we go. But with this, there's going to be some other elements that I'm going to use to kind of scoop with this unleavened bread. And the first one is right here. Uh, This is called marar. 
or you may know it as horseradish. It's a bitter herb. And so that is to be really the picture of the bitterness, along with the tears, was the bitterness that the Israelites went through while they were there in bondage to, to uh, Egypt. And so there's actually a dipping that takes place with the unleavened bread, the matzah, and this marar, and then you, you eat it. I'm not going to eat that much horseradish right now for you. You probably really like it, but um, I might not be able to, to continue on. So there's this other dish right here, and this one is called cheraset. Uh, it's a mixture of apples, oranges, nuts, all broken up, and that uh, is really the opposite of marar. The cheraset speaks to the sweetness of life, because as much as there's bitterness, there are also those times of sweetness, and the Lord, His blessings certainly bring those, even in the midst of bitterness. And so there's another dipping that takes place with the unleavened bread, and, and one eats that. Then, together, there is another piece that, of unleavened bread that picks up the uh, marar and the cheraset together so that there really is that taste of both bitter and sweet together. I once heard somebody say, isn't it great that God teaches us theology through food? And that's really true with this Seder plate. All of this is very significant in pointing forward to uh, God's salvation plan, not only back there in Egypt, but also his salvation plan for our sin. Just like Israel was in bondage, to the Egyptians, we're in bondage to our sin, and God desires to redeem us from that. Well, there's two more items here for me to speak about. The first one is the egg, and the egg, this one certainly would have come in after Jesus' last celebration of Passover, because that is really a monument to the destruction of the temple. So this egg is also dipped in the salt water. Uh, so that there's those tears uh, as a reminder of that. But this brings us to the lamb shank bone. And this is really the central piece to the Seder plate, because this points to the lamb who was slaughtered, and its blood would be placed on the doorposts of the Israelites' home. This is going all the way back to the initial deliverance of God's people from Egypt. And with that blood of the lamb, on the doorposts, God would pass over that home with his judgment. He would not bring judgment upon that home. So this lamb piece is so important because it also had to be a lamb that was perfect, without blemish. That is what we find in Jesus, the true Passover lamb. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, the last part of that verse tells us that Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. He is the one truly without sin. And isn't that great as we look at the Seder plate and are reminded with also the matzah, the unleavened bread, that that points to sinlessness as well. That is all found in Jesus himself. So this is the Seder plate that would be used. This is what Peter and John would have been preparing, whatever elements would have been included. Certainly the lamb shank bone, uh, the marar, and uh, uh, the unleavened bread. Those three items are essential. They would have certainly been a part of this Seder plate. Well, I want to catch up with Jesus and his other disciples as they came in to that upper room and read just a little bit more about that from Luke 22. And so at this point, I'm going to read from verses 14 through 16, it tells us this, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And you notice there in verse 16, the word recline was used, and that is why I have these cushions located right here. Of course, they would not have been sitting at chairs, but they would have been reclined like this on their sides. And as you read further into the account, we're not actually going to get as far as uh, where this is described today, but they would have been leaning on each other all the way around the table. 
And so this is the posture, this is the way they would have been sitting with Jesus at this celebration. Why reclining? It wasn't something they did ordinarily any other day. It was to rest in the fact that they had been delivered from Egypt. The very first Passover, they were in flight. They were fleeing from the Egyptians. Now, as we celebrate any time after, there is that peace because we are no longer in flight. We are able to celebrate the Passover with peace. And hopefully next year in Jerusalem as the whole Passover meal ends with, and we'll get to that later. So reading on then, verses uh, 17 and 18 say this, After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Now Jesus is taking a cup, that says. So here you'll notice I actually have four different cups filled with grape juice. And uh, that's very significant as, as we'll get into in a little bit. But there are four cups. The very first one was called the cup of sanctification. That's the one we just read about in Luke 22. Because this, this Seder, this meal is set apart from any other meal. It is something extra special. And so there's that cup of sanctification, cup of uh, being set apart that starts off the meal. The second cup we won't read about in the account, but this one is known as the cup of judgment or the cup of plagues. One of the parts in God's deliverance of his people from Egypt was to bring plagues, a total of 10 plagues upon Egypt in order to have Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, be willing to let the people go. It, it took not just one, but all the way up to 10 plagues. And the amazing thing about each plague is uh, that the Egyptians had many gods, served many gods. And so God was showing his power over those false gods with every single plague that he brought upon Egypt. And so that's what that cup is all about. The third cup is known as the cup of redemption. We are going to read about that particular cup uh, just a couple of verses down. And then there is the fourth cup, and that is the cup of praise. It, uh, it's used at the very end of the meal in celebration, in praising God for his great deliverance, for his redeeming work. And so again, this first cup, Jesus set apart this meal with his disciples. But we go on from there, and we'll come back to the third cup in just a moment. But in verse 18, listen to what is said there. It says of Jesus, And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, over here, you know you've already seen the unleavened bread, the matzah. I also have another little tray right here with uh, flaps. There's three compartments in here. So there are three separate pieces of this unleavened bread. It's believed that this points to the Trinity of God. So we have God the Father, we have God the Son, which is Jesus, and then of course, God the Holy Spirit. Now, the middle piece is taken out traditionally during the Passover, and it is broken in connection with Jesus saying, as he broke the piece of bread, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, a piece of that bread is, is actually used. It remains at the table. But the second piece that's broken from the, the middle portion called the afikomen, this piece is hidden away. This is a picture of Jesus' body being buried in the tomb. Now later, when the camera's not rolling, I'm going to hide it somewhere in this very upper room. And uh, on Saturday, we're going to have the opportunity to find that together. And there's some significance with that. But that's coming later. For now, I really want us to focus in on the fact that Jesus' body was broken. And he wasn't speaking about the Passover lambs of the past. He was speaking to his own body, to his disciples that night. For those of you who are familiar with communion or the Lord's Supper, 
This sounds very familiar. We, we quote these words when we take communion. That's where communion came from, from this, the Passover Seder. And we're going to see that come into even greater detail as we go on into verse 20. This is the last verse we'll read in Luke 22 today. Look at what it says. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now that is this cup, the third cup. The cup of redemption, as I mentioned earlier. Isn't it interesting that the cup that is really clarified here is the cup of redemption? The very cup that Jesus speaks about as his blood is the cup of redemption. We are redeemed. We are purchased back through the blood of Jesus. Back in Exodus chapter uh, 6, I'll go there for just a moment. In Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, it tells us this. Therefore, and this is the Lord, by the way, speaking to Moses, right before all the ten plagues and the redemption of Israel. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. And so, as a matter of fact, through that verse and the following verse 7, all four cups and their significance are spelled out in those verses. But I want to highlight again this part where he says, And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. He is there speaking to the fact that he ultimately, through Jesus, would be redeeming us, not just from bondage uh, to Egypt, but bondage of sin. And so that is why the, there is a cup involved in the Lord's Supper, in communion. We have the, the small piece of bread, Jesus' body being broken, and we have a cup of grape juice or wine. That is so significant. Isn't it interesting that it's that cup that Jesus used, the cup of redemption, to say, do this one in remembrance of me. Well, I want to share one more part about this whole concept of redemption, and it really focuses in on the piece about the lamb. The lamb is so central, again, to Passover. And so in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, it says this, For you know that it was not with perishable, perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. And so we see that in Jesus we have a Redeemer. We see that going through the Passover Seder, the Passover meal, there is truly this, this uh, point being made all the way through, pointing forward to Christ and what He would be doing in His great act of redemption on the cross. It was after this meal that Jesus spent with his disciples in Luke 22, it was the very next day that he died on the cross as the Passover lamb, redeeming not only his disciples, but all who would place faith in him from every generation. God is our great redeemer. We get to celebrate that through Passover. We get to celebrate that daily. Let me pray with you. Lord, we thank you so much that you, you teach us through this food, that you teach us your truths, you teach us your salvation plan that was, was purposed even before creation. You already knew. You knew that we would need a Redeemer, and Lord, there is no other Redeemer to be found but you yourself. And so Jesus, you came, and you willingly took on a human body and willingly went to the cross to die for our sins, because you were the sinless one. And by being the sinless one, Lord, you were the one who was able to, to satisfy the just wrath of God against our sin. Jesus, we thank you. We praise you for that. We remember you right now in this moment and the great sacrifice in order that we could be redeemed. I pray that that redemption would be sounded loud and clear 
through this community and through the globe, that more and more would know and hope and experience your redemption. In your name, Jesus, amen. Well, I encourage you, whether you celebrate the Passover Seder or not, today and in the following days, make that a part of your prayer for the community and the globe around us, that God's redemption would be made known. Shalom.